To say that 2024 was the year of the AI breakout would be an understatement. From OpenAI becoming a household name to NVIDIA dominating the market to Alphabet's Gemini launch and Apple getting in on the action with new iPhones, 2025 could bring even more innovation as the incoming administration does plan to wind back efforts to regulate AI, hoping they drive what they call an aggressive innovation agenda. Joining us now is Sandbox AQ CEO Jack Hittery. Sandbox AQ now valued north of five and a half billion dollars after a more than three hundred million dollar fundraise last week. Congrats on that, Jack. Thanks, Harry. It's uh, great news and really puts us in a great position for success in the coming years. We've now raised over eight hundred million dollars in total between our last round and this round. So and you haven't been shy about what you're building. You're building the next Microsoft. Well, we want to build something at that scale, the scale of Microsoft and Google. And why is that? Because while a lot of people are doing great in language models, you mentioned OpenAI and Anthropic, great companies and a lot of applications with language. The bigger market, the bigger B2B market is in quantitative AI, AI that drives new drug development, new uh, materials for cars and space and planes. These are the bigger areas of the economy. And I think 2025 will have more news from ourselves and many others on B2B AI versus just consumer AI in 2024. And this is your sweet spot. I mean, we, we've talked to you on this show many times. Anyone who follows AI should know your name, Jack. But just remind us on what Sandbox AQ is doing versus some of these other large language Exactly. Models. So Sandbox AQ, what's the AQ? A is for AI, Q for quantum. These are the two twin engines that are going to drive our economy forward. AI, of course, because you can look at lots of data and build patterns. But in the area of B2B AI, it's not so much that we use the Internet as our training set. That's the language, folks. Here, we actually generate new data based on the core equations, the equations of new drugs, new medicine for Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's, for cancer, new materials that we need for batteries. We're going to see a lot happening in AI and energy in 2025, the build out of data centers. That means more battery storage. What are those batteries made of? We need AI that knows chemistry, not just cat pictures and Reddit. And so this is going to be a very, very different kind of AI that you see emerging in 25, 26 versus what we saw in 24. And what, what types of deals are you signing? Is it, is it for all those things that you're describing? It, exactly. The, the largest companies in the world, uh, as well as universities and others, they want to use this new kind of AI that is really quantitative in nature versus language in nature. And that's, I think, going to be a big theme that we see for Sanofi, who we've announced as a customer, and many others as well. I actually had the, the good fortune to talk to Sanofi when they actually announced they were going to be using uh, AI in some of their drug discovery uh, I want to ask you, we're talking about B2B AI. What's the overall goal? So you're mentioning, yeah, you can, you can find car parts, um, but if you throw a lot of money at it, I would imagine you'd be able to find it faster as well. Is the idea here that you're finding it faster with margin expansion, with more profitability? I mean, what's the overall gain here? Because obviously you have to invest in your product. You have to invest in your platform. Yeah. So I think that people ask us a lot, uh, Frank, how do we play the AI play? How do we invest in AI? And certainly you can invest in particular companies. I think the bigger play, 25, 26, is for public investors to look at the public companies in every major sector. So be it pharma, be it automotive, be it energy, there's going to be winners and losers. Companies like Sanofi that are using AI and drug companies that are not really taking advantage of AI. But they've signed with Sandbox AQ. You should buy their well, stock. Well, that's right. That of course, saying? if they sign with us, there's no problem at all. <laughs> but, um, but really taking hold of this for product development. We see large language models as a way to cut costs. That's an awesome thing. Every company should be using large language models, for example, to cut their customer service costs, right, and use language models for that. But that doesn't really help in the multi-billion dollar product development, value creation. That's what LQMs are about, large quantitative models. They're about creating huge amounts of value in your new products. That's what LLMs are not doing. So it's AQ, the second, the Q's for quantum. Now let's talk about quantum. Let's, let's, let's talk. Yeah. I mean, we just started talking about it a couple weeks ago with That's the Willow chip from That's Alphabet. Right. Yeah. Um, I was actually fortunate enough to talk to uh, Sylvia Jablonski from Defiance ETF. She has a quantum computing ETF. That's right. Uh, a few months ago when I first heard about it. How is quantum going to change the world of business in 2025, or is it? Is this a 2026 story, or are we going to see meaningful developments involving quantum computing next year? Right, so two phases, two stages to quantum. Right now, we're using quantum on GPUs, on NVIDIA GPUs today. We announced the partnership over this past year with NVIDIA, with Jensen and his team. It's going really well. The ability to adapt these equations of molecules, molecules speak quantum, that's the language they speak, on GPUs, on the NVIDIA chips and other chips like that. So that's today's stage of quantum. Coming up in the next few years, we'll start having quantum computers from places like Alphabet, Google, from other companies like SciQuantum, IonQ, that's a public company that IBM. went up. 
it was exactly, and others. And we're going to start actually merging and having QPUs, quantum processing units, alongside GPUs. Well, what does that do, Jack? I mean, we're what does it a do? lot of words. Yeah. <laughs> GPUs and QPUs. It's a head spinning. Yeah, but what is that actually going to do? We that try to AI have as much jargon do? as possible. Frank. As much <laughs> jargon as possible. Because wasn't AI possible. supposed to change the world? So you can't change the world twice within yeah. a couple years, these right? Are, these are two synergies. And so um, where do you get the actual data from to understand how to make that next drug, how to make that drug for cancer? The quantum world gives us that because when a drug is interfacing with a tumor, that's a quantum interaction. And so the quantum world, be it on GPUs right now or be it on quantum computers in the future, it gives us that data. Then you apply AI to it. So it's a two-step process. Quantum gives you the data. AI gives you the patterns and the prediction. That's how it interacts. So what, what does 2025 have in store, given the changes we mentioned in the administration, given some of the technological progresses, progress, and do we hit a wall on, for instance, abilities of large language models? Well, I think we're starting to see some cracks in the wall on the language model side. Ilya Sutskever, uh, formerly of OpenAI, gave a big speech just two weeks ago at the NeurIPS conference in Vancouver, talked a lot about how we're hitting a wall in terms of the data. Because, again, the language models need this huge body of data from the Internet with all the words that they need. But at the same time, ChatGPT5, it was just reported by Wall Street Journal and others that it's not converging well. They've been working on it for 18 months now and not really getting where they want to be. I think we'll see more success from OpenAI in 2025 in their reasoning models. You heard about O1, now O2, now O3 is out, being shown on a private basis to a number of researchers. I think OpenAI is going to have more success in 25 with its deep reasoning models that you can use to interact with, almost like a human, than it is in the language models. And another area for 25, Sarah and Frank, I think is going to be great, is humanoid robotics. We're mm -hmm. going to start seeing the early prototypes come out, um, look at Tesla, look at the uh, incredible accomplishments they've had just in a year, look at companies like Figure, Aptronic, many others, and we're going to start to see the Chinese rise up with humanoid robots as well. My prediction to you today, we can check in a year from now, at the same time next year, there's going to be a geopolitical issue between U.S. and China on humanoid robots in the next 24 months. Like they're going to start fighting each other? Our robots no, no, they're, they're, robots? No, this is going to be a, 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 an issue around economics because the Chinese robots coming out are going to undercut the pricing of the U.S. and other Western robots. And I think there's going to be very interesting competitive issues that will rise up to be a geopolitical issue. Jack, can I ask you a question? I know we got to go, Sarah. Uh, I was at the Hope Global Forum in Atlanta yeah. a couple weeks ago. Yeah. A lot of AI experts there. I heard someone, a well-known AI expert, they told me on background, but they said the U.S. is only four months ahead of China when it comes to AI. It depends what part of AI. So it's, it's certainly in some areas, China is definitely catching up. They're pouring billions into it. I do think the U.S. has the advantage today. We have the... Uh, the best talent. We have university systems. We have to keep investing in our university system, Frank, to maintain this edge. That's absolutely critical. Jack, we could talk to you all hour long, but Boxing to be robots. continued. Boxing yeah, robots. Why not? Why not? We should just do it. Let's duke it out. That. Duke it out with robots, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Jack Henry, we'll continue to watch as well with the uh, Sandbox AQ. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.